Good afternoon and welcome to the Preservation Association of Lincoln Brown Bag. My name is Eileen Burkton. I'm the coordinator of these brown bags for PAL. Um, we want to recognize the loss of a great friend to the Preservation Association of Lincoln who just recently passed away. Jim Seacrest was a very generous supporter of this organization through his longtime membership and gracious gifts, through his assistance with a benefit for PAL last year at his family home and other behind the scenes help that he gave us. Jim was awarded the 2005 President's Award for PAL, from PAL for his work on Amendment 1. Um, this provided tax benefits for historic preservation. Jim was also a past advisor for, to the National Trust for Historic Preservation. We recognize and honor Jim for his great service to preservation. Our videotaping today is sponsored by the Historic Preservation Fund of the U.S. Department of the Interior through the Nebraska State Historical Society and the City of Lincoln, a certified local government. Um, our speaker today is Ed Zimmer. Ed is a native of Omaha. He has an undergraduate degree in art history and sociology from Lindenwood College in St. Charles, Missouri. He lived in Boston for 11 years and was a freelance architectural historian. While in Boston, he received a PhD at Boston University in architectural history. In 1985, he returned to, to Nebraska and, and became the City of Lincoln Historic Preservation Planner and a position that he still holds. His talk today is titled, Brief and Brilliant, Putting Paul V. Highland's Lincoln Commissions in Context. Please join me in welcoming Ed Zimmer. Thank you. Now, I don't know that this talk today will be brief or brilliant. That'll be, I know it won't be brief, so it'll be up to you uh, whether it's brilliant. That's my capsule description of Highland's time in Lincoln. Uh, Highland did four, was well known, it's probably unknown, but he was known in few circles for four prominent buildings in Lincoln. The uh, First National Bank building at 10th and O, 1910, Terminal Building right across the street from it in 1916, Frank and Nellie Cochran Woods House on Sheridan Boulevard in 1916, and uh, James and Gertrude McAfee's house at 18th and C, a fabulous white townhouse, um, also 1916. So in these, this six-year period, a Chicago architect designed four buildings in Lincoln, all of which are listed on the National Register of Historic Places. And if you looked back um, in, I think, any available source just a few years ago, you wouldn't find much else about Paul V. Highland. This tries to correct that situation. And this is an outgrowth of a project that the State Historical Society, under the guidance of David Murphy, uh, has been working on for the last several years um, called Placemakers of Nebraska, the Architects. Uh, and it's a curated wiki um, on which David, and he allows me to contribute also, um, um, Lynn Myers of Omaha uh, contributes information on Omaha architects and other contributors also uh, add pages to this site. And you can see uh, the web address uh, under the title Page Makers of Nebraska, the Architects. And as we started working on Highland, um, we try to give an individual page for each architect, a separate page for um, partnerships that, that, that may have had an independent period, um, and then we link together. Ah, I can hear me. Can you too? And we link together the pages um, so that from one page to another, you try to get the full picture. For Highland, it's taken us four pages because Highland uh, is working in Chicago, uh, getting educated in the early 20th century, takes the Chicago registration exam, or the Illinois registration exam for architects in 1902 and fails. He doesn't take it again until 1908 when he passes, forms a partnership with a man named Green and soon we start seeing him in Lincoln. Um, 
the terminal building, maybe they're best known. As I try to put him in context and, and understand his career and, and who this figure was who did some very fine buildings in Lincoln, um, it also puts in context a little bit the early 20th century development of Lincoln. If we're looking across Government Square from uh, the corner of 9th and P, uh, we can see St. Paul Church has just been built. This is probably about 19 one to 1905 period because we don't yet see the first wing of the new post office that we would call Old Fed. Right on the corner in front of us just to the left of the U.S. Post Office and Courthouse that we would call Old City Hall uh, is the first National Bank building in its 19th century building. Just a few years later, and this would be about 1910-1912 image, as we look in that same angle uh, we see a much more urban environment, a, a modernizing Lincoln, downtown Lincoln, with the first wing of the post office added on the north half of the block on the east side. And right down the center between the two uh, post office buildings and labeled above it because it's the tallest building in town for a brief six years is the First National Bank building. That's the first of our four prominent Highland-involved buildings. Uh, this one on the drawings is labeled Highland and Green. Uh, Mr. Green was Herbert H. Green, uh, and their partnership lasted all of about four years in Chicago. But this building, and this is by somebody who had just passed his exam two years before. Uh, there will be mysteries left when I finish, but I will have told us much more than we knew previously about Highland. But one of the mysteries that remains is that's a pretty fast start um, for somebody to come to town and, and why he's hired in Lincoln to, to do these buildings is not so clear. But if we put that one aside for a second and go across the street, um, in 1916, Highland is back. He is now no longer partnering with Green, but he's picked up a drafts, young draftsman who becomes his Lincoln superintendent and representative, uh, Joseph MacArthur and MacArthur is his uh, employee and partner through several Nebraska buildings, and I will explore MacArthur in this talk as well. And they build the newest, high, tallest office building in Lincoln at 10 stories compared to the eight stories next door of uh, the First National Bank. It wants it wants more of me than I'm ready to give it. We'll put it aside for a second and find the Frank and Nellie Woods house, um, Sheridan and Lake, also built in 1916. And finally, the McAfee house uh, in near south on 18th and C streets. Just in the last few months, I'm using some wonderful online resources now available where a lot of the early trade journals, um, business magazines have been scanned. Uh, and there's a site that provides many of them. Uh, started to be able to find Highland's other work at the time. And this is the um, Muscatine, Iowa State Bank of 1909-1910 about a $60,000 building, uh, a lot of money in a small building. Uh, Muscatine's uh, eastern Iowa, right on the uh, Mississippi River community. Um, and this is the first known Highland design. And so he's, it's not eight stories tall, but it's a very substantial uh, expenditure. And actually, the big tall hotel behind it, I'll get to that one in just a minute. Um, it's kind of fun going online now that you can zoom over communities like Muscatine. So these aren't perfect photos, but um, I didn't actually do a safari to find all of these Highland buildings that might still be standing. And the Muscatine Bank is very much standing still, um, two blocks from the river. Um, we actually find through some of those um, journalists, there's one called American Contractor that lists projects all around the country. And Highland came back in 1920 and added 
in addition to the bank, and that's still there as well. While based in Chicago, Highland was working um, throughout the Midwest, um, mostly Illinois, but quite a bit in Iowa and Nebraska. Uh, this was a Wisconsin building by Highland, uh, Bank of Sheboygan, uh, built about 1910, and as the postcard says, um, of Georgia Marble. And then we bring him back in 1910 to Lincoln. Uh, the First National Bank building was the first to exceed the height of the uh, Burr block, uh, two blocks away at 12th and O, at six stories tall. This was all of eight stories tall. Uh, it's on the National Register of Historic Places, nominated by Matt Hansen, uh, and was a fine example of a Chicago office building atop a bank. One of my favorite features of it that's invisible today, but originally it had a staircase down from the 10th Street sidewalk to two little storefronts in the basement. Uh, one of those, I think, was a barber shop, and the other was the cigar manufactory of Mr. Herminghaus, the father of Ernst Herminghaus, the first um, educated landscape architect from Nebraska, made cigars down the basement of that building as his occupation. Uh, you can't see those stairs down anymore, but if you walk by the building on the granite base of the wall, you can find the spot where there are four carefully placed holes that would have been the top brace of the banister that went down to the basement. And so the holes are still there in the granite. Once you put holes in granite, they'll be there a long, long time. Uh, so you can find that little bit of evidence of that staircase. just barely see it on the drawing, but those are the two storefronts uh, down in the basement under that big bank uh, um, palace type first floor. Uh, Lincoln was obviously very excited about this building. They published it widely in, in the Chamber of Commerce type publications. Lots of postcards of this building um, as it was first built. And it's still there in very, very nice condition. It's lost a little bit of that cornice um, these terracotta cornices sometimes did not survive, um, but it was a quite sympathetic removal of that and the integrity of the exterior of the building is still very high. Uh, not quite so high on the bank room on the first floor, um, but here we see it uh, during World War II era uh, when there's a Christmas party being held in the bank room. In this process of gleaning projects from the early trade publications. Um, we've also been able to identify a considerable number of other, some mostly rather small um, Lincoln projects by Highland and his partners. Uh, and we find that in 1911, right next door to uh, First National Bank building, uh, he has commissioned to remodel the Mayer Brothers department store. And so there it is, uh, the immediate east neighbor to the bank building. Uh, this was a pretty extensive remodel to remodel or change the front. Uh, we found the building for it, for it as well, and it was a $12,500 project, so um, pretty, pretty substantial uh, to rebuild that front. I think it had appeared much more like that Victorian piece still le left next to it with the big peaks. At one time, Mayor Brothers had six or eight of those peaks along O Street, and here they've kind of made more solemn and commercial and modern uh, their front. And we can see it here in a real photo um, over the streetcar uh, with the remodeled Highland front. Uh, he also at that time, 1911, was doing a bank in Mattoon, and I haven't been able to find whether the bank in Mattoon still stands, so I don't have a picture of it. You'd think there'd be a postcard, um, and for many of these there were, but not that one. Yeah. We'll a closer look at Mayer Brothers. However Highland got the First National Bank Commission, uh, he obviously was able to springboard it to some other very prominent clients in Lincoln, and a small project, but for a very prominent client at the corner of 11th and D in 1911, he had a $700 project to build a garden house for Frank and Anna Hall. So while the mansion isn't Highlands, the green 
uh, glazed tile roof down to the right, or as we see it in this lovely Elizabeth Dolan painting, uh, the garden house and the garden um, of the halls. Uh, right, right in those early years, uh, I think she put a 1914 date on this painting, and it is still there. A uh, very lovely little piece of that grand house on the corner. Dolan could light up the interior and let you see the fountain in the back, which my photograph doesn't really show, but I can cheat. And so there is the fountain at the back of that garden house. Lovely terracotta feature built into the alley wall um, and still remaining there. He also, it was a $700 project to build the garden house, according to the building permit, but another $1,000 to build the brick and um, iron fence that surrounds the double lot property. There's a brick wall all along the alley and along the west edge of the property, and then iron on the south and on the east. So we get that lovely little house, which still has great, beautiful lattice work surviving. And the fence is still there, although it's a little harder to take a dramatic picture of an iron fence, but a, a nice one. 1912, he's doing another bank in Cedar Falls, Iowa, Citizen Savings Bank. I can't swear this is the Citizen Savings Bank because banks change their names almost more often than anything else, um, but it is clearly a Highland type bank that's still standing as a beauty salon in Cedar Falls. And then also in 1912, he designs the Iowa State Savings Bank in Burlington, Iowa. Uh, and this looks quite a bit like our First National Bank building uh, with a grand base really encompassing two stories in this instance, um, and otherwise a very similar office tower on top of the bank portion. That one still stands, but it unfortunately has lost much of the character of the base. So it's a um, 1912 building sitting on top of probably a 1980s or 90s space. He starts to get a few commissions in Chicago. Uh, I find really rather few. Um, when you look at the list of architects practicing in Chicago in the early um, couple decades of the 20th century, it is an enormous long list, so it's not surprising that he's looking elsewhere, but he does get um, a couple of school commissions for the St. Ignatius uh, parish, uh, a grammar school, and one that's only described grammar school in 1912, and one in 1919 that's described as an 11 room school. I think it is these two buildings side by side. Um, now the Waldorf School in Chicago. And then one of my favorite Highland projects, not necessarily for the building itself although it's a nice enough small town bank. But just imagine you get a commission in 1913 to build a fine neoclassical bank in Grinnell, Iowa. And you finish it up and they issue postcards and you're feeling pretty good, maybe for all of one year. <laughs> when Louis Sullivan finishes his Merchants National Bank in Grinnell, Iowa, and no other bank in Grinnell, Iowa can hold his head up after that, I imagine, although we may see a little bit of Sullivan influence after this um, episode, um, but it's pretty hard to match the jewel box banks of Louis Sullivan. But one year apart. But not at all beaten, um, back in Muscatine, Highland gets the commission for the Hotel Muscatine, which was that building just down the block from the bank. Um, a huge structure with the biggest gallery projection off the front. They really did build that. That must be the river view from uh, the private dining rooms. But this huge hotel building, which on the postcards of the riverfront stands up very tall and proud. We don't quite see the bank, but we certainly see the hotel. And it is still there. Um, now as condominiums somewhat altered with a kind of cap on top and some balconies, but that incredible projecting terracotta space still projects out. And now the riverfront is not industrial as in the postcard, it's um, a clear, cleared site for access to the riverfront. And so it must be a great view from that space or from these condos out to the Mississippi River. And this is 
1914. A little sewing shop in Nebraska City, um, the Otto County National Bank originally, uh, about an $18,000 project of 1915, and this starts to bring Highland back into our state. Um, and it looks like it really has most of its exterior frame in the terracotta, and we don't know on a building like this just what's under the metal screen. Uh, from the website of the sewing basket, it does not look like a bank room on the first floor any longer, but I don't know what might still survive on the facade. Um, and Nebraska City was a little bit too big of a town to issue postcards for each bank, so I've not found a great early view of this. It must be out there somewhere, but I haven't found it yet. Now, this isn't really quite 1916, or I have to kind of telescope together um, the construction of Frank and Nellie Cochran Wood's house on Sheridan in 1916 and the design process, because we start finding Highland in the journals doing design work for uh, a house in Lincoln for Frank Woods in 1913. So soon after building the First National Bank building, he's already designing a house on a site that won't be platted until 1916. Um, Sheridan Boulevard would have been there, but the, the lot on which it sits um, isn't registered until 1916 when the house was built. One of my favorite views of that house with one of the, um, what we guess might be a pin oak um, coming in. I wonder if this survived, although I don't think a lot of the early Woods Brothers trees survived. They planted a lot and they don't show up then in the early construction. Highland not only designed the Italian Renaissance Revival style house for Woods, but also offered a site plan uh, with a driveway coming down to a big kind of um, circulation area in the back and a, stick, and a um, feature right at the sidewalk on the curve of Sheridan and a sidewalk coming up to maybe a fountain in the front yard. And on, in this, uh, Highland has another one of his brushes with fame. Uh, this design isn't built. Instead, the woods use Jens Jensen of Chicago, very prominent lands national scale landscape architect, to design uh, not only Frank and Nellie's house site of a couple acres, but the whole Woodshire sub or Woods Crest subdivision of 1916. So Highland gets the house, but he doesn't get the grounds. Um, it, instead, it's Jensen with a much more organic, free-flowing sort of landscape style and a beautiful curved driveway that's all in red brick that comes sweeping across the front of the house. Um, we have a uh, various uh, yards separated. There's a, um, one of Jensen's favorite features towards the back. Uh, he liked a, a little circular fire pit area deep in the backyard. Uh, kind of a campfire area. There were times when this site, while well maintained, wasn't reflecting much Jensen, and this is probably about late 1980s. Um, there are times when now, under the loving hands of uh, Joan and Tom Rusa, not only is the house in beautiful shape, but the grounds and uh, much of the Jensen character has been restored as well. Uh, a spectacular house within the Boulevard's National Register District, but also individually listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Uh, the Hruses also restored the Jensen Pond, a uh, little fountain pond in the backyard. And this is a house that, that doesn't really have a backside. This is the back, uh, but these are the um, sunrooms. And on the upper floor, notice those aren't double hung windows, those are triple hung. Uh, from inside, the, the uh, sill of that window hinges up, and you can drop all three panes down into a pocket in the wall. So those sleeping porches on the upper floor could have completely open windows with no glass um, blocking the opening at all. And that's why you've got those unique triple hung windows there. And another lovely feature that reminds me somewhat of some of that um, heavy lattice work on the garden house or the hall house, um, this back uh, feature on the uh, Woods house. This built-in design process begins in 13, it's built in 16, 
and 16 is when uh, is the year when Highland is back um, in Lincoln with a vengeance. Um, and right across the street from the First National Bank building with the flag flying is the terminal building under construction. We know this must be uh, summer of 1916 because we see leaves on the trees and they proudly built the terminal building in just eight months uh, between January and August of 1918, 1916. We see it looks like they're finishing up the canopy work at this time. They haven't quite finished the mezzanine windows. Um, here it is a couple decades later but in its glory um, white terracotta on both of the street facades a uh, big beautiful canopy wrapping the north side and most of the length of the east side. It's called the terminal building because it was the terminus of the streetcar system of the Lincoln Traction Company. And Lincoln Traction, um, you can see a streetcar um, track bending um, on the street in front of here. Um, but they also were an electric company because they were generating their own electricity to run the electric streetcars. And so up on the top for a time, they had a great big sign announcing that they provided light, heat, and power. Um, well, not even listing anymore that they also provided transportation, because that was the shrinking side of the business. Seems appropriate that an electric company would light itself up bright at night, um, as in this view. And in this one, you can see at the center of the uh, north canopy, a little projecting space and that bay window that comes out just a little bit over the over, on the mezzanine level uh, over the marquee was the streetcar dispatcher's room where you could not only look out and see cars circling around Government Square but also with that little bit of projection see up and down O Street a little bit and see where his streetcars were uh, in their progress. The, this building has the most verbose plaque I think I've ever seen on a building uh, in the lobby where they want to make sure they have recorded in bronze that they built it between January and August of 1916 and then credit the, their full board of directors, um, the architect and his superintendent MacArthur. Uh, Selden Breck was a big deal construction company and they put this up in eight months um, kind of showing their stuff. They build a lot in Lincoln, they build even more in downtown Omaha, and they were a regional company. They had offices in uh, St. Louis and I think in Chicago. And then they list all of the subcontractors um, down to who supplied the mail chute and the vacuum system, vacuum cleaner system, which would have been built into the walls, the granite as opposed to the marble. Um, it's all there. All buildings should be required to have a bronze plaque just like this one. Um, beautiful lobby still today. And on the upper level of the lobby, you get these grills in front of the uh, windows that face onto the lobby at the mezzanine level with a big T for, for uh, terminal and for traction. Uh, very handsome building yet today, listed individually on the National Register of Historic Places and one of the grand terracotta buildings in town and still beautiful cornice. Great detail. And it proudly announces its name to everybody coming into town to the west. Um, this has all been fact so far. I'm going to go indulge here in a little wild speculation then I'll get back to fact again. Uh, in 1916 the Woods Brothers moved from their um, office in Haymarket, now the Ann Burkholder building, um, up to South 13th Street, um, just across the alley um, now from Walgreens. Um, beside them on the north was the Nebraska Telephone Company building which they purchased and they moved from, and they had a whole collection of little companies, or little and big companies, and they moved from that office down in Haymarket near the depot up to really the center of the financial district in downtown Lincoln. Um, we've never identified other than didn't the Woods Brothers corporations themselves design this front, but it sure looks to me like being built in 1916 with Mr. Highland um, doing work for uh, Frank Woods and 
knowing his banks, that it would be plausible that Highland had a hand in the Woods Brothers building um, on South 13th Street. Back to facts. The um, fourth grand building of 1916, or the third of 1916, the fourth grand building in Lincoln by Highland, and here assisted by MacArthur, his, his employee, uh, is the McAfee House at 18th and C Streets. Um, the most unusual of all of those designs, a real elegant townhouse uh, in that neighborhood. Looks rather stark today, but originally all of those blank plaques around the um, parapet had very rich Sullivan-esque ornament. One of those still survives underneath as the ceiling of a little cover at the canopy uh, where you enter the house on the um, east side. You can see a little bit of that rich um, kind of organic geometric combination that characterized Sullivan's ornament. And one reproduced uh, large plaque down in the, in the center of the main C Street facade is very Sullivan-esque, I think, in its style of ornament. Um, and I don't know that this, he doesn't have to have been bowled over by the Merchants National Bank in Grinnell, but he would have had to have noticed. <laughs> and he's coming out of Chicago. I have a few interiors of this house that um, I don't think it's in any covenant that it has to be owned by a designer, but it was McAfee who had it built, uh, was an interior designer, uh, and it has been through a succession of architects as homeowners, and today um, Dave and Susie Erickson uh, live in it and obviously love it, the fine care they take of it. Uh, this is the fireplace right behind inside that plaque on the outside. Uh, this is the musician's balcony that overlooks that room. Um, at least by lore, uh, McAfee, when he was impressing a client, would get them seated in the living room and then unfurl bolts of cloth from above um, so that they could not possibly resist his offerings. An oddity of the house, um, Gertrude McAfee was Gertrude Marquette Story McAfee. Uh, she and and McAfee had married in their, um, she was in her late 30s, he was in his late 40s, I believe, when they married. She was widow of an English officer who had died in Africa. Um, they had together had one son. She came back to Lincoln, built a house at this corner in about 1902, and then when she marries McAfee, they decide to build the big house on the same site. They pick up the corner house and move it to what becomes the backyard and it's a tenant house for years behind the big house. Then when um, Mr. McAfee dies several years before Gertrude, she sells the front house, moves into the back house again, and it remains standing on the site until uh, just a couple decades ago. Uh, the predecessor owners to the Ericsons took it down and finally added a backyard to this fine, spectacular house. Very ordinary, ordinary Lincoln lot, and this is no bigger than an ordinary near south backyard, but the house had never had that until just a couple decades ago. Uh, it has a lovely view onto that backyard uh, and sun porches, um, providing a lovely place for uh, the musician when near south featured this house on home tours a couple of years ago. While that house and all of this Lincoln work is going on, uh, Highland is also uh, continuing his work in smaller towns throughout the Midwest. And in Abingdon, Illinois, does a bank and Masonic Hall for about $20,000 in 1916. Small community, um, and the building still stands, but um, not, not quite holding as prominent um, a main street as it looks like it did. Not quite the same case in Mammoth, Illinois, 1916, where the bank becomes a city hall and still is a very prominent building. This was a $50,000 bank when built in 1916. In Alexis, Illinois, 1917, the Iowa State Savings Bank, no, the first national bank of Alexis uh, is built. Um, and it looks like maybe it's been converted into um, an apartment or two.
Highland had a great time in Colony, and I'm not sure, Colony, um, Illinois, where he had three or four commissions, at least three different banks. Um, he did alterations for Colony State and Savings Trust Company in 1917. In uh, 1918, he remodeled two buildings into one for a new front for Union State Savings Bank and Trust. And from the looks of this, that it looks as if he's maybe combining two different sized buildings, like this might be that one, although it's now People's National Bank. And then um, he's back in 1921 for First National Bank. Um, in between, he had done a Knights of Columbus Lodge Hall in Kalb um, in 1918. Continues to pick up some work in Lincoln, um, remodels the interior of the First National Bank building uh, bank room in 1917, just seven years after he built it, and in 1918 remodels the first story of the fraternity building at 13th and N for Woodman Accident Life. <coughs> but his biggest continuing impact on Lincoln isn't Highland's design, but rather his young assistant MacArthur. They worked together in Lincoln for about three years, and then about 1918, 1919, MacArthur goes independent and takes on some major projects, both in Lincoln and in downtown Omaha, uh, that have very lasting impact on both communities. This is MacArthur's first independent project in Lincoln in 1918, uh, the Nebraska Buick Building at 13th and Q. Um, about $150,000 building had auto showroom on the first floor, and the upper floors were for car storage because Nebraska Buick was a multi-state wholesaler for Buick around the whole region. Uh, the Stewarts and the Seidels were the um, moving forces behind that company, and um, Seidels will also give us a continuing thread through MacArthur's work. Here it is in 1923. Um, you might remember it in various names since then. For a while it was Gunny's, when Taco Bell was there. And now, still there, but under a rather uh, different disguise of a paint job for Nebra National Research, um, who've been building their offices from the top floor down as they've grown, so they kept some parking in between, um, but uh, retail on the first and still that very sturdy, adaptable building above. Just slightly later, uh, MacArthur and Highland um, are building another Nebraska Buick building in downtown Omaha, not quite as large. Uh, this is 1918-1919 at 1901 Howard Street. Uh, and the substantial growth of industry is, is the Omaha World Herald's suggestion that maybe these automobiles are around to stay. Um, they're now seeing really big buildings connected to that business, and um, they think it might be a, a real thing. The building still stands with uh, quite altered dark glass windows, um, but still a very um, handsome and prominent building. My most recent find has been um, Troutdale in the Pines. Um, and in the American Contractor magazine of 1918, there's a listing that Joseph G. MacArthur um, had a project to design a $100,000 hotel for Harry Seidel's um, in Bear Creek Canyon, um, Colorado. It sounded quite fanciful when I found it, and I was pretty sure I wouldn't be able to learn anything about it, but no. <laughs> um, Troutdale was a very popular hotel. Uh, was actually built uh, about 1920. Um, this um, H.E. Seidel's was of the Nebraska Buick Seidel's and of the Seidel's still in Lincoln today. Um, and was a fabulous resort hotel um, tucked into this steep canyon uh, right against the hillside. Apparently employed as much as possible Nebraska college students every summer to staff the hotel. Um, they would accept people from other states, workers from other states, if they couldn't fill their whole roster with Nebraskans. Um, but it was part of their um, operating principles, built of the local stone um, and, and um, stucco, uh, and was 
a very prominent uh, summer resort, uh, torn down just a few years ago um, after some years of uh, passed out of the Seidel's hands and still operated for a time, but then was neglected and lost. But this was, as far as I can tell, because I found some good articles about the hotel, the connection between MacArthur Seidel's and the hotel um, had been lost from 1918 until last week. MacArthur also got some prominent uh, house designs and for very leading Lincoln clients, uh, Thomas C. Wood's house right next to uh, Frank and Nellie Cochran's Wood's house at 2475 Lake. Bert Falconer's house at 2485 Woodscrest, um, 1922. And I'm gonna move my Highland Dan. I'm gonna finish up MacArthur and then go back to Highland. Um, but, Faulkner was, work, was one of the uh, VPs for the Woods Brothers. Uh, and the E.J. Faulkner House at 4100 South, also 1922. But MacArthur, with the construction of the Nebraska Buick Building in Omaha, had moved his principal uh, place of work from Lincoln to Omaha and his residence to Omaha. Uh, and he becomes involved in some of the biggest downtown Omaha buildings of the 1920s. Uh, Medical Arts was a building uh, where construction started in 1922 on a design by Thomas R. Kimball and John McDonald, uh, very prominent Omaha architects. This 1922 image shows when they had topped out the steel in 1922. It would have looked much the same with rust in 23 and 24. The owners went broke uh, and the building was stuck for a full three years, standing with just the steel skeleton. Um, in downtown Omaha. Then Selden and Breck, the builders uh, and uh, private investors come together to get the me medical arts building going again. Uh, Kimball and McDonald sue that when the original owners had gone bankrupt, they hadn't been paid for their architectural services in full, in part but not in full. They lost that suit and MacArthur and a um, Chicago architect, William Spencer Crosby, were hired to finish the Medical Arts Building, um, and that was accomplished in 25-26. So the architect of this building was all of the above, apparently, but in the completion of it was MacArthur um, and Crosby from Chicago. Uh, this is when they've just resumed construction in 25. It's a very hard building to find stories about in the years between, because I think everybody turned their head when they walked by it for three years, because it was um, a very conspicuous eyesore downtown Omaha for a while. There's medical arts um, as sketched, um, presumably by MacArthur, and as finished um, in 1926. It was demolished in 1999. Just about that same time period, just a little bit later than medical arts, uh, MacArthur comes back to Lincoln and does the next tallest private office building in downtown Lincoln, the Sharp Building um, at 13th and N, on the same corner where the fraternity building had stood um, that MacArthur had been involved uh, with Highland in remodeling a few years before. MacArthur back in Omaha does the Hotel Paxton um, in 1928, um, still standing as condominiums. And then a final project does the Reddick Tower in downtown Omaha. Uh, now the Hotel Deco, I don't know if it's the Hotel Deco 15 or the Hotel Deco XV, um, but it's one or the other. Uh, and a very handsome high Art Deco style building, maybe the um, masterpiece of Art Deco in Nebraska. Uh, and this is Highland's work, uh, not Highland's work, MacArthur's work. Um, who only um, lives till 46, till age 46. He dies in 1934, I believe it was, in Omaha. Uh, and that finishes my MacArthur story, but I haven't finished Highland quite. I told you it wasn't brief. I have to go back a couple of years to finish up Highland because he's continuing while MacArthur's now doing um, some very large works uh, in Omaha and Lincoln and in Colorado. Uh, Highland 
is still doing lovely banks in towns across the Midwest. Uh, this is the Mercer County Bank in Aledo, Illinois, the Keokuk Savings Bank in Keokuk, Iowa, which still stands, Farmers State Bank in Astoria, Illinois, 22. He also starts to get some work for Loyola University uh, back in, in his uh, home city um, and did the alumni gym in 1923, unfortunately has been demolished. Uh, Mount Pleasant, Iowa does First National Bank in 23. And in 25, now Highland with a partner, uh, Redmond P. Course, uh, is doing quite a bit of Chicago work and in this row of uh, residential buildings, the red brick one in the center is uh, Highland and Course's uh, first work that I have found. And finally gets a building taller than we've found to date uh, and almost impossible to photograph apparently in downtown Chicago. Uh, the equitable building of Highland and Course, 12 stories tall uh, at uh, 180 West Washington. But it is possible to get a photo of the top floors of it, so um, I have to look at the two of them together. And then a last project I found um, at 1801 South Indiana in Chicago, a building that today is the field house of the adjacent Chicago Women's Park and Gardens, uh, and provides some retail space on the first floor, a museum, um, and yoga rooms and um, other park park and rec uses inside the handsome building. And it's also Highland's um, next brush with architectural history glory, because if we go up, it sits right across its little beer garden from the Glessner House, H.H. H. Richardson's masterpiece house in Chicago. So he likes to be you know, close to those really, really prominent ones. You've walked by Highland buildings all over the place. You just never knew it. It's, it's happened to me. Um, so there's Glesner right beside and the um, full, full website of the Nebraska history uh, site, placemakers of Nebraska, the architects. And that is the context within which our four plus smaller projects now I learn, um, and who Mr. Highland was, and these weren't the only buildings he did, they were just the only ones we'd known about till now, and now virtually a dozen people have heard of Paul V. Highland. His, some of his descendants gave uh, some of his papers to the Art Institute of Chicago, and um, I think that might have to be a visit sometime and just see what's there. One little note in their very nice finding guide says that he prepared a list of 17 banks he had done. I think I found 18 or 19, so maybe I don't need to go to Chicago. I'd be happy to take questions if you have them. I think we've got just a few minutes left. Anne. Yes, I have a comment. Anne Seidels, do you yes. have a question or comment? A comment. A family lore is that uh, when the Seidels family, that's my family, uh, when they were in the Buick Agency, uh, that that trap bill was built to entertain the General Motors bigwigs. And so that, that, I don't know if it's true, but that's what I've heard. Um, Anne was commenting that this family story was that Troutdale, um, Troutdale in the Pines or Troutdale Hotel was built to entertain General Motors bigwigs. From what I could tell, there's a couple fine articles on Troutdale. Um, it entertained almost everybody um, and had, um, very hit, large clientele, not just from Nebraska, but nationally and national entertainers appeared there. There's a good article showing the ballroom at Troutdale, and I think they had big names, but also a vacation place for big names. Um, there's also a comment that it maybe was more a, a wealthy man's plaything than a um, business venture. Uh, so I think after um, H.E. Seidels died, it was hard for others to run it because he had run it out of enjoyment. Exactly. And then when you showed the terminal building at one point, you had assigned it to German American State Bank, which I wrote down the name. It was above the, the overhang. 
the German American State Bank. Yes. And in German National Bank in Lincoln had been at a couple of prominent locations. So they had been in, I think, the first floor of the Burr Block, um, and then they move over to the big, tall new building. But yeah, the German National name was one one of the many changes that occurred after dur during World War One. Argue with your family, in. <laughs> yes. Dr. Troutdale, is you, you mentioned it was in Bear Creek Canyon. Is that well, Denver, Morrison, Evergreen? Is that what? I, 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 yes, I, I believe Trout Creek is in the Evergreen vicinity near Denver. Okay. Because when I was in graduate school in Denver in the early '60s, that was still there. I remember driving by it. Yeah. It was. I don't know if it was still operating, but it was there. And then a few years ago, I was back out there, and I wanted to drive out and see if there was anything left of it, and I couldn't even find the location. I, I, I think the final demolition was something like 1990. Uh, it stood in ruins for some years before yeah, that. I remember just but it, falling apart. Yeah, it operated, a, okay. operated quite a long time as a hotel, and apparently lots of young Nebraskans spent their summers working there. And by the articles I've read, when you were off duty, you got you got to enjoy the the resort features, golf course and fishing and swimming. There's a swimming pool as well as the creek. Um, so you you were a hotel worker, but you you were a guest on your off hours. Um, and I think the family connection and the that they were it was Nebraska's um, a Nebraskan's hotel, and he was he preferred to staff it with Nebraska college students. I think. Highland lived in Chicago throughout. Um, he he ended his partnership with Cross or Course um, in 1931, but then went back to work in about 33 and worked for some of the for various firms. Apparently, more as an inspector or an architectural engineer than as an architect. Uh, through his early 40s, retired to L.A. in 52 and died there in 66. But that's all available to you online now <laughs> at Placemakers of Nebraska, the architects. Thank you.